Again, welcome. The, the, what triggered my wanting to do this particular talk is I do love the area of surrealism and uh, I, I just noticed that there was going to be an auction at Christie's Paris of, you know, M Man Ray works and, and not only works, but a lot of property of, of, of basically Man Ray's very, very close assistants. Um, and what's going to be great about this talk is you're going to see that Man Ray is, um, I think, a highly versatile artist. A lot of people are not sure quite who he was. And the, the auction is led by the photographs department at Christie's because first and foremost, many people think of Man Ray as someone that broke new ground in the area of photography. But you're going to see that the actual items um, up for auction include paintings, include um, you know ready-mades because he was very friendly with Duchamp. It includes film stills from films that he did. So this was an extremely versatile artist. So let's get started. I just want to um, look one one more time and make sure yeah, that yeah, I think it's not in in the full screen. And I I've asked my my lovely sister. Do slide view on your PowerPoint. Oh yes, thank you. My lovely sister's gonna. She's she's um she's gonna be my tech advisor. Thank you, Karen. So so here we are. We are gonna get into this right now, and you're gonna learn a bit more about what this kind of image was and is, and why that was groundbreaking. So the auction that I'm referring to is happening tomorrow, and it's happening at 2 p.m. Central Eastern, Central European time, so in Paris at two. Uh, but hey, if you see some lots that you love, you know, you can wake up at 5 a.m. from the Pacific Standard Time or not too early here in New York. Um, I wanted to show you the catalog for this auction. Um, it's called Man Ray and the Surrealists. And the reason this is a really interesting auction, a really wonderful auction, is because it is the collection of the two people that became Man Ray's very, very close, um, let's say, uh, assistants. Um, Lucien Treillard was a man that in, was working in the sixth arrondissement in Paris at a, at a printer and publisher. And Man Ray uh, came at some point in 1960 and wanted some lithographs done. They became friendly and through the decades, Lucien became the person that together with his wife, Edmond, they basically were the ones collecting Man Ray, setting up his exhibitions, writing about them. Lucien Treillard is the um, undisputable expert of Man Ray. I, I can't say um, anything more. Uh, he basically is someone that spent enormous amounts of time with Man Ray. And so here we have an auction of 180, 88 items that belonged to this couple. I wanna remind you that initially this was gonna be a, a, a one hour talk. And the more I got into it, the more I realized that there was no way I was gonna cover Man Ray and other surrealists. There's just no way. And, and part of that was that the more I learned about Man Ray, the more I got into all the different things he did. So um, I wanna alert you that today, we really will be doing a deep dive on Man Ray. Um, please join me in two weeks because we are gonna then, I'm calling it Beyond Man Ray. And that is gonna be a presentation about <clears throat> photographers that were in and around France at the time and also we're gonna go global. We're gonna to go to Mexico, the US, we're gonna to go to the UK, Morocco, Lebanon, and, and basically the influence surrealism has had globally for, for decades and through to today. So very exciting talk in two weeks. The format of today is I wanted you to think that, you know, normally without COVID, I could actually take you to the auction house, well, certainly the one here in New York, and we get to see the lots for sale in person. And, and I do hope some of you will join me in the future to do that for photographs, auctions here at Christie's or Sotheby's. 
this auction we can't go to as easily. It'd be nice, right? It's at Christie's Paris. And I, I thought we could make believe that we're there looking at the lots virtually together. I wanted you to think of kind of realize where Christie's, it's not in a bad place. Let me tell you, it's between the Arc de Triomphe and the Place de la Concorde. So pretty glamorous area here in the eighth. And uh, here you've got the Musée de Louvre and the, palette, the, the opera, the Garnier. Um, so the other thing I thought would be fun, you know, is if we are looking at lots in an auction, is I'm gonna just give you a mini, mini guide to, you know, buying at auction. The, the, you saw the catalog there. These are these gorgeous, gorgeous printed books that the auction house creates. When I was an intern in the Christie's Photographs Department, I was able to contribute to those. Um, they've of, of course gone virtual. Um, if you wanna buy the printed version, you actually have to buy it. Um, I think if you've collected in the past as I did, uh, sometimes you, you do get it for free. So it's like, if you've invested in photographs, we'll send it to you. But let's look at what a typical auction catalog entry looks like. I just thought that this would be useful. Um, it, this auction has uh, 188 lots. And you'll normally see, you know, the lot number there, the artist, and then in the case of this photograph, the name is Integration of Shadow, or as we'll talk about, it's called Woman. And what you'll usually have is an estimate uh, right there. This one, and, and I want to make you aware that this is in Paris, so the prices are in euros. We'll talk about that. I, I want you to bid correctly. You need to multiply <laughs> that or add 20% because right now the dollars are, um, you know, it's an exchange rate of 1.2. Um, the estimate is the valuation the auction house has come up for this item based on a number of factors. Let's talk about the tricky world of valuation of photography. Um, photography, as you know, is a reproducible medium. What does that mean? Well, it means that there's hundreds and thousands of images in different types of prints that all look the same, at least to the untrained eye. You know, I can cut out a Man Ray picture from a magazine and put it on my wall in a nice frame, and it looks fantastic, and it might be worth $5. That same image, if it's signed by Man Ray, a vintage print from when he was alive, and maybe even owned by MoMA is gonna be worth up to a thousand times the value of mine. And so this is what's really fun about collecting photography is that um, to the untrained eye and someone that doesn't wanna collect for real, you kind of think, well, why would I want that image for $20,000 if I can get it for 10, it'll be up on my wall. And that means that you're looking at it for its beauty, but not necessarily for its collectible value. What I included on the left are some of the kinds of things you'll see typically in a catalog entry. You will see the image, you know, in this case, the artist, the estimate, the name, and then you're gonna see the details, the, you know, the, the size, you're gonna see if it's signed or not signed, if it has a certain kind of stamp, very importantly, the provenance, as some of you know, means where has this particular print been before? And frankly, in this auction, the fact that it belonged to the collection of these very close people to Man Ray, that matters a lot. Sometimes this is where you might see again, it belonged to MoMA, and that makes it really special too. Um, we're gonna look at a particular Man Ray work later on that broke records for Man Ray at over 3 million uh, and why it was worth that much. We're talking about, again, a piece of paper over worth, worth over $3 million. And then finally, the literature section is interesting. This is a section that talks about in what important books of art or otherwise has this image appeared? Um, and usually, you know, that can also boost the value of a photograph because it's, it's a renowned work that's often been talked about in the canon of art history. And the last thing we'll do, and then we'll jump into actual art. This is my buyer beware slide. 
when we're looking at these estimates, you might see one that says five to 7,000 euros. I did a little math for you. I do have an MBA. I wanted you to remember that that right now is a little bit more in dollars, or at least, you know, don't forget, we're talking euros here. If you get that item at 7,500 euros, which is, you know, it is above the estimate, you're looking at almost $10,000. Now, here's the thing that many collectors, well, people that haven't collected at auction don't know. There's something nifty, not so nifty, called the buyer's premium. These were implemented in the 90s by the auction houses. And initially, when they came up with this idea, um, they were told, you're, you're going to die. No one's going to want to pay that. The, the auction houses normally made their money from the consigners. You know, you take a cut of what they're gonna make on their sale. But in the 90s, the auction houses decided, well, why don't we make some money off of the buyers? Because frankly, we're bringing these artworks to them. And it is nothing to sneeze at, it's 25%. So that item that looked like it's, ah, it's five to 7,000 euros, suddenly grew at hammer price to 7,500 the buyer's premium is an additional 1875 totaling 9375 so uh, i can speak for personal experience <laughs> watch out for the actual acquisition price let's talk about man ray then many people that have heard of man ray even myself for, for many years and i really hadn't looked much into him assumed uh, he's french and assume that Man Ray must be some kind of pseudonym. And by the way, this is lot number one. It is actually a, a self-portrait, an auto-portrait of, of Man Ray. But actually, so I wanna tell you a little bit about Man Ray. Little Man Ray was originally Emmanuel Manny Rutnitsky, and he was born in South Philly, and what, what I found really fun about this is I, I used to work in the streets of South Philly right out of Penn and, and there was a famous Jewish deli on Bainbridge called the Famous Deli. I think it's still there. He was there before the Famous Deli, but in exactly that Jewish quarter of Philadelphia. By the age of seven, his family moved to Williamsburg, New York. And by 1903, he had his bar mitzvah. Um, but one of the things, well, so a couple of things about this. Number one, you will see that eventually as an adult, there's very little Jewishness about Man Ray. It's almost as if he's moved on. You know, once I had my bar mitzvah and I went to France, that was the end of that. Um, and I changed my name. His father was the one that based on anti-Semitism changed their name from Ratnitsky to Ray. So all he really had to do is go from Manny Rutnitsky to Man Ray. So not a pseudonym, but now you know a little bit more of the history. And guess what? That year that he had his bar mitzvah, I thought this was a cute factoid, was the year that the Williamsburg Bridge was inaugurated. What's amazing to think about this is that, you know, you will wind up with one of the most avant-garde artists and by the way, in a major exhibition at the Jewish Museum in New York, um, it was said that he actually is considered the first Jewish avant-garde artist. Now, this is important. He worked at his father's um, tailor shop. His father was a garment worker, as many immigrants were, especially Jews. And his father, who went by Max, had a tailor shop, and Manny was working there. The reason I want you to think about this is because there will be significant motifs in his art. You will see sewing machines, you will see irons, you will see works that look like they have swatches of fabric in them. Where he really learned how to draw and start you know, becoming more adept at actually drafting and drawing was the Brooklyn Boys High School. Now I wanna give you some background because the reason um, he wound up in Paris uh, is quite clear. I wanna take you back to the kind of art that was being made, not only in the US, but even in New York at the time. You know, the Ashcan School was a school of essentially realism. 
And if you think about you know, the history of, of art in, in America, even since the 19th century into the early 20th, you know, Winslow Homer, Singer Sargent, you're talking uh, eventually Edward Hopper, these, these, these people, uh, the realist kind of the Ashcan school, it was about depicting um, figurative painting of the reality of America, in this case, let's say the city dwellers. So the Ashcan school, um, were, were artists that were capturing something that you could argue is not very avant-garde. It almost takes us back to Courbet, um, Millet, people that were kind of like, let's look at people you know, in the countryside of France. Well, now we're looking at them you know, in the city, but, but it's not abstract, it's not very avant-garde. So little Manny, now Man Ray, starts going to places like Alfred Stieglitz's art gallery called 291 on Fifth Avenue. This gallery, I can't, I can't under, uh, you can't under, you cannot overstate the importance of Alfred Stieglitz. He was not only a photographer, but he was the first art dealer in the U.S. and in New York that was bringing, he was the first one to bring Picasso. He was the first one to bring Matisse. He was the first one to bring Brancusi. In this space on Fifth Avenue, by the way, it's at around 31st and 5th, if you're wondering where 291 is. And he was, you know, the leader of the photo secession movement. And he had a magazine called Camera Work. And he is considered kind of the most important dealer bringing the European avant-garde. And, and by the way, Man Ray liked the Ashcan school and looked, used to go to the to see the old masters at the Met and love that but this he was like this is really cool. In 1913 there was a watershed exhibition at the arm at the armory that's now called the 1913 armory show and it was outrageous it was groundbreaking it was all of the above because it was the first time that tons of the artists from Europe were being exhibited in New York. Um, and, and I, I wanna remind you, New Yorkers and, and Americans were looking at this kind of art. And if you think of what someone like Frick was collecting and uh, very exciting, I'm gonna go see the Frick collection now at the Breuer uh, uh, over the weekend. Uh, the American taste of European art was not for new art, it was for you know, it was for European Vermeers, it was for El Greco, it was, it, was, it was for the old masters. This brought art that had never been seen. Matisse, for instance, uh, here's one of the works that was shown. You're looking at a nude that is really contorted using what we call non-local color because you know, bodies are not blue, they're usually pink, and, and plants are not, you know, red and, and yellow. And so colors are completely off, and we'll talk about that. Or uh, something like a Brancusi the Kiss, that is not the kind of sculpture Americans were used to. Uh, it's, it's very stylized, it's very avant-garde. And I know I'm doing a lot of setup, but uh, I think it's important because it's gonna show you where Man Ray wound up. Man Ray wound up here meeting Duchamp. And one of the works that caused the biggest commotion at the Armory show was Duchamp's new descending the staircase. One critic called it um, an explosion at a, at a shingle factory um, because this was again, completely new, completely different. And, and this fun cartoon, uh, in the newspaper, uh, it says seeing New York with a cubist and they called this cartoon, the rude descending a staircase rush hour at the subway. So again, um, this kind of art was very poorly received at the beginning. Uh, some people said, you know, art is over as we know it, this is crazy, but very important meeting here. Actually, um, I correct that. Van Ray met Duchamp about two years later, but he got exposed to his work here. Now you're gonna think, wow, I thought this was a photography talk. Yeah, but you see, to understand the type of photography we're gonna talk about, 
I wanted to give you a timeline and kind of a grounding on where modern art had been since the mid 19th century and particularly in Europe, because it'll explain a bit more of, of the context for Dadaism and Surrealism. When you go to a master's course, like I did at Christie's in modern and contemporary art, guess what? You start in around the 1850s, 1860s with the first people that started rebelling against the establishment, the impressionists that forget the Paris salon, we're gonna create works that <clears throat> are not even about the subject matter the salon likes because they liked big historical subjects and mythological Venuses. We're gonna do landscapes and things like that. And we're gonna use brush strokes and ways of depicting nature that have never been seen before. I'm not gonna go into every movement, but the point of this slide is to tell you that there had already been a lot of rebellion in the art world for um, quite a few decades. So from Impressionism into Post-Impressionism, Fauvism, which were the so-called beasts, and the Matisse I showed you is an example of that. These were artists using, you know, look at this, it's a forest, it's, it's red. So again, we don't need to paint things the way you see them. We can make them emotional and exciting, green, red, whatever. Then arrives Cubism, which starts breaking things down in several planes and geometry and almost approaching complete abstraction. The reason I wanted to show you that is because by the time Dada comes, you have to understand, some of you might say, my God, this, this stuff is absurd. Well, guess what? All of this have been called absurd. The first Impressionist exhibition had caused outrage. Um, all of this, these were called beasts. It came because a critic went and said, these are beasts. So there's a history of re, you know, rebelling, reestablishing what art can look like and be. And, and I just wanted to show you that, that we are gonna be talking here. Manny, Manny Man Ray is born here. He gets to the Armory show there, meets Duchamp here and moves to Paris there. And guess what? Dada is what's in fashion, followed immediately by surrealism. The last thing I'll say about this slide is that then World War II comes and guess where he winds up? I don't think you wanna be Ben Ray or Manny Ritnitsky or anything like that during the war. And uh, eventually he does go back to Paris. So let's talk about Man Ray first and foremost as what he saw himself as. He saw himself as a painter. And in this 1913 landscape on the left, you won't be surprised to see that he's using kind of the approach and style and vocabulary of cubism. Um, he even calls his landscape fauve, like the beasts of the Matisse and company Derain. And um, it is, that is his idea of a landscape. So he's already starting from the, forget the Ashcan school and the realists, I'm, I'm going avant-garde. This is a, an incredible painting at MoMA and um, it's incredible for many reasons. First of all, it's highly abstract. He calls it the rope dancer accompanies herself with her shadows. The idea uh, that, well, the legend says that he went to a vaudeville show and there was a rope dancer and he kind of looked up at her. And then when he was back in his studio, he started using construction paper and started sketching different figures of the dancer when these different color card um, construction papers fell on the ground, he liked this kind of array of colors on the floor by chance. And he said, those are gonna be the shadows, the shadows of the dancer. And he created this oil painting that is essentially referencing collage because the, the, it's an oil painting, but it's an oil painting based on pieces of, you know, cut up paper. Remember I said you were gonna see tailor related materials and process? Well, that is like swatches of fabric. And at the end, he kind of puts this very abstract dancer up there. These are supposed to be 
the, 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 the cable or the, the rope uh, and, and, and it's really crazy and it's highly abstract, but he's basically saying I'm a painter and I'm doing the kind of work that they're doing in Europe. So guess what, at this auction, you, you can't have the painting, that one's at MoMA, but you can get a lithograph of that for about, well, I'll figure about $900. You'll understand why we're doing a lot of setting up. Um, right before um, he would move to Paris, um, because he was so friendly with Duchamp, Man Ray started doing work that was very Dada-like. Let's talk about Dada. Dada is a movement that was born in Zurich, Switzerland at the Cabaret Voltaire. Why Switzerland? Guess what? It's in the middle of World War I. Artists went to a place that was neutral. Artists wanted to be in a place that was not in the middle of a war. And these artists, their attitude was, you know, logic and, 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 and national, um, patriotism and logic and the establishment and the bourgeoisie have led us to one of the longest, most horrible wars. We never knew it was gonna be this ugly. You had men coming back with, without limbs, with, without arms, you know, um, and, you know, as we know, this was a terrible, the war of, of the trenches. And these artists from Romania, from Germany, from France, uh, from Switzerland, gathered in this cabaret and started creating what would become Dada. And, and this was a very formal movement, as some of these were, with, with kind of a political manifesto. They were drawing from political manifestos and saying, we are going to have an official manifesto. And the manifesto is about undermining everything that came before us. We don't like the bourgeoisie. We don't like their artistic sensibility. We don't like patriotism. We don't like what the establishment has done. And we don't know what logic has led to. So Dada is about being illogical, being radical, being anarchist being iconoclast and the kinds of things you saw from this mix of artists were things like sound poetry i highly suggest you go to youtube you can hear hugo ball the founder of the movement reciting his poem caravane it is complete gibberish it's really fun because he's standing there in a really wacky costume and he would do a performance at the cabaret voltaire and it's what called sound poetry. It sounds, but they're not really words, they're sounds. Someone like Duchamp became famous for his ready-mades. I mean, what could be more rebellious than saying, you know, let me make the bourgeoisie sensibility upset. I'm gonna take a urinal, I'm gonna turn it upside down. I'm gonna call it fountain and I'm gonna submit it to a major art show. And then people like Hannah Hawk using collage. Um, the point about this movement is that it's not about painting or sculpture necessarily. It's about really, it's about ready, you know, ready-made objects found, crazy poetry, collage, which at the end of the day is about cutting existing images. It's a whole array of art that goes against the norm. So speaking of Duchamp, because he's going to be really important in this presentation, and here's lot number 10. That is a picture that Man Ray took of Marcel Duchamp in 1919 before he moved to Paris. Um, some other examples of Duchamp ready-mades. And by the way, um, these were, they were uh, intentionally shocking, crazy, absurd, all of the above. Um, and, and now, uh, of course, he's considered an absolute pioneer because it was all about, you know, questioning everything that came before. Why shouldn't this bicycle wheel that I basically planted on a stool not be art? And by the way, this one was, was known for being right in his studio. It was his first one. Um, he would take something like a coat hanger and put it on the floor and call it trap. 
It is about taking objects that are already created and manufactured, turning them upside down. They no longer serve their original purpose. You know, the urinal is now a fountain. The code hager is now trapped. And in this very famous one, he took a postcard that you could just buy of the Mona Lisa and put a little mustache on her. And, and then there's this, this is a, a, a pun that, that, that if you say it in French, kind of refers to her booty. Um, I'm not gonna go into all of that, but the point is that this is about being rebellious. Marcel Duchamp is almost the ultimate prankster and Man Ray really likes this stuff. So let's look at Man Ray uh, early photography in his data period. We're talking about objects, right? Taking objects. So he calls this one on the left, man, and it's an egg beater. And he, the one on the right, which by the way is, is up for auction, a print is up for auction, calls it woman. Um, what these are, these are, this is dark, dark room equipment. It's, these are puns, these are clever. This is again in keeping with Dada, which is let's take objects and personify them or do something funny with them. And of course, in his case, he's taking photographs of them. And Man Ray actually created his own ready-mades. He was like, I'm gonna make stuff like Duchamp. So he took a, uh, an iron, remember that he a, uh, was a tailor and um, he attached some tacks to it. So of course, you wouldn't really use this iron, right? It's lost its meaning, it's lost its usefulness. And he calls it, again, something ironic like gado, gift. And by the way, this is actually not a photograph. You can actually get one of these because his estate reissued five of them in 1972. So you can get this Man Ray gift for 10 to 15,000 euros. And then uh, what, what's fun about Marcel Duchamp, again, the prankster, this kind of like performer, um, he went by, sometimes he decided, I'm gonna go by Rose de la Vie. And, and that, is, that is a play on words. It's Eros, like the God of love and c'est la vie. Um, and, and he actually would dress in drag and called it his alter ego. You know, Marcel Duchamp sometimes went by Eros c'est la vie. And Marcel Duchamp, and by the way, these are photographs by Man Ray. That's why I wanted you to see some of what he was doing in this data stage. Man Ray created, just as he did items, he created a perfume and normally, it's kind of a play on words, it would have been Belle Elaine, which by the way is my mother's name, so I thought this was brilliant. He changes it to Belle Allen, which is beautiful breath. And he puts his picture of himself, of Rose la Vie, on this perfume. By the way, I know you're gonna be shocked. This perfume went at auction. One of these little bottles went for 11 and a half million dollars couple of years ago. One of the last pictures I'll show you of his data work um, or, or kind of this period. Um, this is at auction at Christie's. I thought it was really interesting. It's, you know, that Paris had the biggest Ferris wheel in the world. It had been initially built for the 1900 Universal Exposition. And around 1920, they started disassembling it and using parts for something else. And what I love about this is it's the year that Man Ray moves to Paris and there is nothing other than an object that I, this was my interpretation. It's an object that no longer is what it used to be. It's like kind of a Ferris wheel, but not really. And to me, it takes me right back to looking at something like that is no, not, not really a, a useful bicycle wheel again. Some of the images of this time frame are of artists that he worked with. These were Dadaists, but he would incorporate these interesting objects into them because that was so Dada. It was so much about the ready-mades. 
And when I first saw this, I thought, what in the world is that thing, you know, between Sarah and Cocteau? Well, I found out that Man Ray had submitted Lampshade to an exhibition. And guess what that is? It's basically, you take a lampshade, you unfold it, and you present it as art. This photograph is interesting because I thought you, um, Man Ray and Marcel Duchamp collaborated on really what was the first, be, the beginnings of what was called kinetic art. Um, really wacky stuff. Let's motorize some glass plates. Let's paint the glass and let's make them go around. And so this captures kind of that moment. Uh, and this is gonna be important because you're gonna see he's gonna incorporate movement. God, I'm taking too long. Um, one, one other object he created, again, very much in kind of the Duchampian tradition. Um, this is a metronome talking about kinetic art. A metronome moves back and forth. If you've played the piano, you feel like sometimes just throwing it off the piano drives you nuts. Uh, he thought that by putting an eye on it, uh, he would basically create this, this amusing creature that looks at you while you paint or while you work. Initially, it was called Perpetual Motif. When a woman by the name of Lee Miller um, left him in 1932, she had been there in Paris with him from 29 to 32, we're gonna be seeing photographs of her. He replaced the eye with her eye and called it Object to be Destroyed. I know that's a little bit a little bit aggressive and he actually uh, wrote, you know, this is an object that you should wait just for the right speed and time. And when you can, you take a hammer and you just break the whole thing. And so there's a lot of history to this item. Uh, in the 1950s, some kids who were anti-Dada went to an exhibition and took a hammer and did exactly that. And their attitude was like, well, that's what you called it. So. so now let's talk about surrealism because we've seen, we've seen what, what Man Ray was doing per data. It was photographs of the other data artists. It was incorporating that idea of the kind of the objects into the work. But if you think about it, those photographs weren't that groundbreaking. I mean, yes, they have those funny objects, but it wasn't as if the photograph itself was Wow, an incredibly new process or something. Surrealism is the movement that comes right after. And this was just to acknowledge that, you know, we often say, oh, it's surreal. I found out that Merriam-Webster called it the word of the year. Um, there were a lot of strange things that year, including an election. And it was the most looked up word of 2016. In modern times, it's about something that is marked by the intense irrational reality of a dream, something just unbelievable or fantastic. The reality is it comes from the French and it was poet, playwright, and art critic Guy Guillaume Apollinaire that term, you know, coined it initially for his own play and also in 1917 for a Ballet Russe Ballet that had been a collaboration between Eric Satie, Picasso, and Jean Cocteau. What's funny is the ballet called itself Ballet Realiste, and Apollinaire is the one that said, no, Surrealiste. That is the enormous curtain that Picasso made for that ballet. Uh, it's Picasso's largest work ever. But look at the dates. We're way before a formal movement. The movement itself came in 24. This man, André Breton, was um, the one that, well, there was a little bit of a battle between two different people, but ultimately he's believed to be the one that launched, launched the movement with his manifesto and, and would go around and literally anoint people as being surrealists. You were very much either in the club or not. And the difference between surrealism and Dada while surrealism also appeared somewhat irrational and strange, potentially absurd, surrealism is, is grounded by the teachings of Sigmund Freud and the interpretation of dreams. 
this is more about going inward. This is not about let's just be political and fight, you know, fight the elite and fight the art world. This is about we're now going into a reality that is in our subconscious. Our dreams often show us wishes and desires that are probably in disguise. And so let's promote work that is in the absence of reason, moral pre pre preoccupations or aesthetics. And, and I wanted you to see that, that you know, once uh, Man Ray was in Paris, he, he moved swiftly, you know, as Dada kind of moved on, he, he, he moved into, he was almost called a proto-surrealist because he was already doing things that were very much the kinds of things this group was doing. I'm not gonna go into this, but you know, I'm looking at the time and I'm like getting nervous here, but you, you all, many of you already know it, what you can expect in surrealistic art. You're gonna expect illogical juxtapositions, like things you dream, you know, when you, when you wake up and you're like, what in the world was that? Magritte's train coming out of a fireplace. Uh, Giacometti, many of you don't, may not know this, but initially he was a surrealist. Look at this creature object called woman with her throat cut. Something like Merritt Oppenheim's object, which is, you know, a fur covered cup and saucer. You're gonna see bizarre assemblages. You're gonna see still some of the puns. And this idea of automatism or chance, um, and the other thing I'll say is, you know, as we know with Freud and dreams, there's, there's often a sexual component to this. The surrealists love this idea of we're going to create art that doesn't have even us thinking about in ahead, ahead of time what it's going to look like. So they would set up these sessions or play this game where you pass a piece of paper around and one person kind of draws whatever kind of their, their mind is loosely thinking and then give it to the next person and then the next person. And so you wind up with work that was a collaboration by artists that all were kind of ideally in a bit of a trans-like trans state. So let's start looking at, uh, at Man Ray's work that is more of the period of surrealism. Some of these are, you know, they're fun, they're not as interesting because they're basically portraits. I mean, they're wonderful portraits, but they are of people in a circle. Salvador Dali here. I like this one of Joan Miró because he does add these interesting ropes in the background. And of course, those are reminiscent of the artist's work. Here's a wonderful portrait of Luis Buñuel. And what's fun is that it's the year right after Buñuel had released that movie some of us have seen, which has that really outrageous scene with the eye. I won't tell you what it is. I'll let you see it for yourself, but it's, it's not only surreal, it's, it's, it's quite outrageous. Let's talk about though, why Man Ray's photography starts really breaking new ground. Just the way back, you know, the realism and the Ashcan school and the city dwellers and all that was like, ah, eh, that's not so interesting. You've got to remember that photography before Man Ray might've been the pictorialists elevating photography to an art like let's colorize and have this gorgeous, you know, photograph of the flat iron or like a Lewis Hine, let's document and use photography as a social, you know, you know, a tool for social change. And then came what we call straight photography. And imagine that's right during surrealism, but these guys and Ansel Adams or Imogen Cunningham, they're looking at capturing every detail of reality. We want the most pristine photograph of Yosemite's half dome, or we want this magnolia to be absolutely perfect. He's like, that's fine, but that's not my gig. 1922 arrives, he creates a book that's considered absolutely groundbreaking. He calls it The Delicious Fields, Les Champs Delicieux, and it includes what are called photograms, which are then based on Man Ray called rayographs. Take a look at these. Let me tell you what these are. 
Photograms are a technique that goes way back to the 19th century, but I'm gonna tell you why this was different. You take light sensitive surface, you know, you, you treat a piece of paper with light sensitive material and you lay objects on them. And then, you know, you obviously expose the paper to light. And obviously the more opaque the objects, you're gonna basically get kind of a negative. You know, um, all of this was exposed to light, but what was underneath this, these little flowers or this hand was not. So this is a camera-less photograph. There's no camera. It's about exposing objects on a piece of paper and exposing light. Now, what makes them so expensive, not only that they were so revolutionary, there is just one of each. Because you see, there's no negative, there's no film. It's just that one piece. This, as I said, goes way back. Um, this woman, Anne Atkins, a botanist, you may remember from another lecture, was doing these. She was basically just trying to get images of algae and ferns. Now that was interesting, but frankly, it was algae and ferns, and that's what they were supposed to be. They were also completely two-dimensional. There's almost no sense of 3D. Um, and by the way, his book and his way of photography appear on Vanity Fair. This was like a new method of realizing the artistic possibilities of photography. It's abstract, it's different, there's no camera. It's just like, this guy's cool. And, and look at this. This one um, is really interesting because it's, it's Man Ray's hand. There's a play on words, which is les doigts d'amour de Man Ray. Man in French is hand. So it's Man Ray, the name, but it's also like the Man Ray hand. And he went and wrote on each of them kind of the five areas he's interested in, the line, the color, the form, the space, the air. And again, um, really kind of having fun with this new process. But what was interesting is you see, he took it to the next level. Normally someone like Anna Atkins would have been outside in the sun, just lay the things there, go when it's done. He did this in dark rooms and he would expose things to light in his own way. And he would choose objects that weren't totally opaque. And so what you've got is that based on varying translucent, you know, some are opaque, some are less, you start getting grays, you start getting shadows, you start getting something that's much more 3D and much more interesting. And again, entirely abstract. And the point of that is I'm elevating photography to being as avant-garde now as painting or, you know, let's say a Brancusi sculpture is already this gorgeous flying bird that kind of looks like a bird, but not really. Well, I'm gonna do photography that's of that nature. These are fun because you can tell what he took here. These are kind of like Swiss army knife type corkscrew uh, uh, bottle opener. This spiral is really great. Looks like a slinky if you're from my era. And one of the most expensive items at auction is this sketchbook that's very clever. Um, he actually, this is already in English, I, I guess, because you don't look at the, the, but he's got rayographs for various of the letters. So airplane, the letter A, that is an actual rayograph. Comb, that's a rayograph. Spoon, same thing. Oh my goodness. Okay, let's talk about objects and ladies. Um, Man Ray had a lot of lovers and a lot of muses and some of his most famous photographs involved this idea of surrealism and taking objects and mixing objects up in strange juxtaposition. So he's taken his lover and muse, Kiki de Montparnasse, and he's turned her into a violin. Um, that is uh, a, a young model of beauty and kind of a, a, a friend of a lot of the artists. And he has, you know, put 
her in the costume of one of Ang's famous odalisques. Then on the print, he's drawn these F holes and he's basically turned her into kind of part odalisque, part violin. Um, it's wonderfully surreal. It's also a game on words because there's an expression in French that's, you know, violon d'angre means a hobby, an activity done regularly in one's leisure time for pleasure. Well, you know, Kiki is kind of his hobby pleasure. Um, and mind you, there's an element or quite a strong element in, in Man Ray's work that objectifies women. I don't think this stuff would go over very well, but you'll see what I'm talking about. Women as objects, women as parts of women. You know, you don't see her legs, you don't see her arms. One of his most famous photographs, Noir et Blanche, black and white, appear in Vogue. Um, you could spend, oh my God, I'm really concerned about time. Um, this wonderful juxtaposition of Kiki de Montparnasse with one of the famous African primitive masks that was so often appeared and, and looked at in, in modern art of the time. The duality of the conscious and the subconscious, Western world and African world, black and white, it's about duality, it's about a real life woman and a doll. Um, there's a lot going on here that you could kind of dissect. Um, and this is the one I said, based on its impeccable condition and the fact that it was owned, guess who it was owned by? It was owned by a fashion designer that also owned the famous Le Demoiselles d'Avignon that now hangs at MoMA. He also owned this Brancusi. So that took the value to over $3 million in 2017. Another famous work, this is actually Lee Miller. Um, you, you put glass tears on her, you take this wonderful close up, the eyelashes look kind of like plastic. And so there's this dialogue again it, between woman and objects. And also this idea that these are like crocodile tears, you know, are they artificial? Is, is sometimes woman's sentimentality fake or artificial? They're glass tears. But again, surrealism, because you're talking about strange juxtapositions of objects. I just wanted you to know he wound up being a major photographer of fashion because Vogue and Harper's Bazaar were like, we love what this guy does. The, the cropping, the angles, the kind of putting women in this case with these objects. Look at this. Uh, this is Breton's wife. And she's got, again, one of these little primitive figures. Look at the angle. It's totally unusual. So the fashion magazines were like, this guy is amazing. Look at this woman with long hair. This is a wonderful example of complete surrealism. There was a, um, a poet that the surrealist kind of grabbed onto and liked because he had had this famous line that said, a boy as beautiful as the chance encounter on a dissection table of a sewing machine and an umbrella. And that was like, we love this. That's exactly what we want to do. We want to we wanna have that strangeness of dreams, that strange beauty. Oh my gosh. Um, that strange beauty that comes from these weird, what's called condensation and dislocation. I'm gonna skip that, just again, fun with objects, but this one's wonderful because it's, here's the little dolls, wooden dolls, and for fun, he calls them Mr. and Mrs. Wood, Mr. And Mrs. Woodman, and there's Lydia, but the thing about Lydia is literally it's like Lydia's head. So, so the whole thing is very dreamlike, very strange, kind of eerie. This one, again, shock value, um, erotic. It has the ironic pun that he calls it prayer. And you're like, hmm, well, that I guess would be the way you pray. But no, then again, your hands wouldn't be there and you wouldn't be naked. 
So Man Ray was a big fan, I know, shocking, of the Marquis de Sade. And the Marquis de Sade, as uh, some of you know, was all about women, subject, you know, it, there was a lot of um, SNM, there was a lot of women being completely subservient, et cetera. But the other thing this image does, it's, it's shocking and it's interesting because it, it, there is no woman. There's basically, there's feet, there's hands, there's buttocks. The buttocks almost don't look human based on the light. They almost look like, I don't know, they look like complete spheres. So um, I'm sorry that we're so tight on time because some of these images you could go on and on about. Um, another really kind of erotic, unusual image, this is, Merritt Oppenheim, the artist, and she, he has placed her behind a printing press and her hand, one of her hands is full of ink. And if you see, interestingly, the handle of the printing press winds up exactly where it becomes almost a phallus. So surrealists were really into this idea of kind of the relationship between the genders and the sexual connection between the genders. And, and this one is, is called er erotic violet, erotic rape. Um, there's, it, the idea is to be um, so, somewhat shocking, uh, enigmatic, strange, mysterious. And then uh, I'll just show you, I think we need to move on, sorry. I am gonna, I just, well, I just wanted to show you that, you know, he, he never stopped being a painter. Uh, these are, are very famous image that he, he painted in the thirties of these lips literally flying over uh, basically a park. And he described the lips as the lovers because he said, if you look at lips side by side, side by side, these look actually like two bodies side by side. And he took a series of photographs featuring the painting and maybe making it even more surreal by adding, you know, let's have a chess set, let's have a nude. So again, this, this weird, again, assembla, uh, juxtaposition of, of, of objects and people. I wanted you to know he did film as well. So at the auction, there's a couple of examples of, um, you know, film stills uh, of the film. And as you can see, very surrealistic, the starfish next to the wine and the bananas. Um, you know, this is stuff that you, you would almost see like in a Buñuel film of the time as well. Let's finally talk about solarization because this was one of the other processes that was groundbreaking. It is said that Lee Miller thought there was a mouse in the dark room and she turned the lights on. The last thing you wanna do in a dark room normally is turn the lights on and voila, they found out that it created these prints that had this really strange look to them. And this became known as solarization and Man Ray pursued it with purpose. He's like, I like this stuff. It gives things this really strange aura. And I thought it was really funny to compare his Calla Willies of 1930, solarized, and in the same year, Imogen Cunningham, again, remember Group F64 looking for that beautiful kind of perfection that you get, that crispness when the aperture is at its smallest opening and look how different they are. So you see a lot of this in his work. This, believe it or not, this, this reminds you how uh, avant-garde and how progressive France was this was an advertisement for the French electric company that he did. It's called, the portfolio was called elect Electricité. And you've got this torso with again, these kind of solarized <clears throat> uh, kind of electrical type of, of, of uh, additions to it. There's Merritt Oppenheim again, posing for him, solarized, Giacometti. And the last thing really, oh, good. I'm, I, I wanted to show you um, something else he's credited for having invented. It's very strange. It's called space writing. He found that another thing that could be very interesting, again, very avant-garde, is to hold a 
pen light and move it facing the camera. But not only that, to make sure that there's a very long exposure. Because I don't know if you know, but with photography, if you have a really long exposure, the image is gonna be captured everything that happened over time with that pen light. So he created these series of, of images that are really fantastic. This one is Marcel Duchamp, space writing. It's Marcel Duchamp is holding a pen light and with long exposure, we're seeing everything that he's kind of writing. And guess what? It looks like that automatism drawing that we talked about earlier. So he, this was like, oh my God, we're doing automatism with photography. Yay, we got to the end. I um, wanna summarize by saying, I hope you enjoyed and agree that this is a very enigmatic and pioneering artist. You know, we started with this idea, is he Manny Ratnitsky or is he Van Ray? Is he an American in Paris? I call it, is he American, is he French? Um, certainly a friend and collaborator of Duchamp. He's both a Dadaist and a surrealist. He is not only a husband, he's a lover of many muses. And the thing about him is that even though the auction is at the photographs department, there's paintings, there's ready-mades, there's photographs, there's assemblage, there's film. He was both cross, you know, crossed over between the fine art world and frankly, to make money, he had to be commercial and particularly fashion. And again, more than anything in photography, he's an innovator that basically took photography to a much more kind of abstract, avant-garde, innovative way than anyone else had done through to that time. The final image is that on his um, self-portrait autobiography, he includes this image of himself. It, it kind of has what looks like a cross in, on his face. And he explains in the book, it's because I'm a camera rifle captive model, I target prey, witness hunter artists come out of America to explore the no man's land between art and photography. And I do want, want to make sure you don't forget to come back in, in two weeks because <laughs> we are now going to be able to actually talk about all the other surrealists, some of them right in France, like an Andre Kertesz with his <clears throat> distortions, Hans Bellmer in Germany. We're gonna to go to the UK with some of the works of Bill Brandt in Mexico with Manuel Alvarez Bravo and many, many more. So surrealism, you know, was not only in France, it was kind of the epicenter, but it spanned out and it lives on today. And the last thing I'm gonna say is, um, you know, I wanna thank you um, for all your support and, and my God, some of you have attended almost every one of these. So it makes me feel really good. Spread the word. These are not limited. Um, tell your friends or colleagues, you can send me an email. Uh, something new, if you'd like to make a donation, what I did is I set up a little um, look at New York Art GoFundMe page. Um, if you go there, um, you'll see what I'm trying to do. I feel like Everyone that sees these feels really good about them. So I wanna take them further. Um, I'm gonna to talk to the YMCA. I'm talking to the Hebrew house. I, I wanna just kind of make, kind of take this to the next level. So, so your, any amount is fine. Donations are very helpful. I think it's in the interest of kind of like free art education. And then uh, many of you often send me like the nicest, wonderful comments, but you know, a friend was like, why don't you do any 